Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. Let's continue our deep dive into the life and times and exploits of Samuel Champlain with the help of excerpts from David Hackett Fisher's book, Champlain's Dream. In Search of Champlain An old French engraving survives from the early 17th century. It is a battle print, at first glance like many others in European print shops. We look again and discover that it shows a battle in North America, fought between Indian nations four centuries ago. The caption reads in Old French, Défaite des Iroquois au lac de Champlain. The Defeat of the Iroquois at Lake Champlain, July 30th, 1609. On one side we see 60 Huron, Algonquin, and Montagnier warriors. On the other are 200 Iroquois of the Mohawk nation. They meet in an open field beside the lake. The smaller force is attacking boldly, though outnumbered three to one. The Mohawk have sallied from a log fort to meet them. By reputation, they are among the most formidable warriors in North America. They have the advantage of numbers and position. And yet, the caption tells us that the smaller force won the fight. The print offers an explanation in the presence of a small figure who stands alone at the center of the battle. His dress reveals that he is a French soldier and a man of rank. He wears half armor of high quality, a well-fitted cuirass on his upper body, and protective breeches of the latest design with light steel plates on his thighs. His helmet is no crude iron pot of the kind that we associate with Spanish conquistadors and English colonists. It is an elegant example of what the French call a casque bourguignon, a Burgundian helmet of distinctive design that was the choice of kings and noblemen, a handsome, high-crowned helmet with a comb and helm forged from a single piece of metal. Above the helmet is a large plume of white feathers called a panache, the origin of our modern word. Its color identifies the wearer as a captain in the service of Henry IV, first Bourbon king of France. Its size marks it as a badge of courage worn to make its wearer visible in battle. This French captain is not a big man. Even with his panache, the Indians appear half a head taller. But he has a striking presence, and in the middle of a wild melee, he stands still and quiet, firmly in command of himself. His back is straight as a ramrod. His muscular legs are splayed apart and firmly planted to bear the weight of a weapon, which he holds at full length. It is not a conventional matchlock, but a complex and very costly arquebus à roué, a wheel-lock arquebus. It was the first self-igniting shoulder weapon that did not require a burning match and could fire as many as four balls in a single shot. The text with this engraving tells us that the French captain has already fired his arquebus and brought down two Mohawk chiefs and a third warrior who lie on the ground before him. He aims his weapon at a fourth Mohawk, and we see the captain fire again in a cloud of white smoke. On the far side of the battlefield, half hidden in the American forest, two French arquebusiers emerge from the trees. They kneel and fire their weapons into the flank of the dense Iroquois formation. We look back at the French captain and catch a glimpse of his face. He has a high forehead, arched brows, eyes set wide apart, a straight nose turned up at the tip, a fashionable mustache, and a beard trimmed like that of his king, Henry IV. The key below the print gives us his name, the Sieur de Champlain. This small image is the only authentic likeness of Samuel Champlain that is known to survive from his own time. It is also a self-portrait, and its technique tells us other things about the man who drew it. A French scholar observes that its style is that of a man of action, direct, natural, naive, biased toward exact description, toward the concrete and the useful. This is art without a hint of artifice. It tells a story in a straightforward way. At the same time, it expresses the artist's pride in his acts and confidence in his purposes. It also points up a paradox in what we know about him. It describes his actions in detail, but the man himself is covered in armor and his face is hidden by his own hand as he fires his weapon. Other images of Champlain would be invented many years later when he was recognized as the father of New France. All these images are fictions. Champlain's biographies, like his portraits, show the same wealth of invention and poverty of fact. Champlain himself was largely responsible for that. He wrote thousands of pages about what he did, but only a few words about who he was. In 2004, historian Raymond L'Italien wrote, 
His activities, which were revealed mainly through his writings, were always surrounded by a certain degree of mystery. Champlain was silent and even secretive about the most fundamental facts of his life. He never mentioned his age. His birth date is uncertain. Little information survives about his family, and not a word about his schooling. He was raised in an age of faith, but we do not know if he was baptized, Protestant, or Catholic. After all this uncertainty about the man himself, it is a relief to turn to the record of his acts, a drama that is unique in the history of exploration. No other discoverer mastered so many roles over so long a time, and each of them presents a puzzle. By profession, Champlain was a soldier. He fought in Europe, the Caribbean, and North America, bore the scars of wounds on his face and body, and witnessed atrocities beyond imagining. Like many old soldiers, he took pride in his military service, but he grew weary of war. Always he kept a soldier's creed of honor, courage, and duty, but increasingly did so in the cause of peace. There is a question about how he squared these thoughts. At the same time, Champlain was a mariner of long experience. He went to sea at an early age and rose from ship's boy to admiral of a colonizing fleet. From 1599 to 1633, he made at least 27 Atlantic crossings and hundreds of other voyages. He never lost a ship under his command, except once when he was a passenger aboard a sinking bark in a heavy gale on a lee shore with a captain who was unable to act. Champlain seized command set the mainsail, and deliberately drove the ship high on a rocky coast in a raging storm and saved every man aboard. There are interesting questions to be asked about his leadership and astonishing seamanship. Champlain is best remembered for his role as an explorer. He developed a method of close-in coastal exploration he called ferreting, and he used it to study thousands of miles of the American coast from Panama to Labrador. He also explored much of North America through what are now six Canadian provinces and five American states. Champlain's place was Saintonge. In his time, it was the name of a province, a people, a language, a culture, and a way of life. The name descended from a Celtic tribe called the Santoni. Julius Caesar's legions fought them, and in the Middle Ages they were assaulted from the sea by the Vikings. They took refuge in islands and marshes along the coast and survived catastrophes that extinguished many other cultures in Europe. A key to their endurance was the Gulf of Saintonge, which, 2,000 years ago, was a huge body of water, much larger than today. Along the coasts and islands of this great gulf, descendants of the Santoni took their living from the sea. The water yielded an abundance of fish and mollusks, and the area is still a major center for France's oyster industry. Marshes around the Gulf also supplied salt, the commodity that sustained Champlain's home port of Brouage. The people of coastal Saintonge flourished in many maritime trades. At the end of the 16th century, a local poet wrote, The marsh worker on his salty plain gets bread, fish, and game without pain. The town of Brouage, where Samuel Champlain lived as a child. Its colorful history was the salty broth in which our hero was cooked. In the time of the Romans, the land around the present site of Brouage lay underwater, submerged beneath the great gulf of Saintonge. As the gulf receded, it left a muddy mix of water and clay that was called Brou. The lowlands that emerged from the sea were called Brouage, which came to mean an area of mudflats and salt marsh. From an early date, villages began to rise on this new land, and one of them was also called Brouage. It was a small trading town, and its most valuable commodity was salt, a gift of the sea and the sun to the people of this region. Salt was mined from deposits in coastal marshes and evaporated from brine in open pans. It was vital for the preservation of food, and so much in demand that it was called the white gold of medieval Europe. The salt of this region was known for its color, variety, quality, and price. Brouage had the most valuable— a black salt that was favored on royal tables. Vessels large and small sailed to Brouage from many lands. Then came the discovery of the North American fishing grounds, and salt was needed more urgently than ever. In 1525, the Norman port of Le Havre alone sent 35 vessels to buy salt at Brouage for the American fisheries. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. 